Good morning, Providence. Uh, today, I'll be reading from Exodus 28, verses 1 through 12. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brothers, and his, your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron, Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abu, Elzazar, and Ithamar, and you shall make me holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all of the skillful, whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. There are the garments that they shall make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checkered work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twin linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple, and scarlet yarn, and of fine twine linen skillfully worked. It shall have two solder pieces attached to its two edges, so that it may be joined together, and the skillful woven band on it shall be made like it, and be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple and scarlet yarns, and of fine twin linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave them on the names of the sons of Israel, six of the names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in the settings of gold fil filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for, their, for remembrance. This is God's word for God's people. You may be seated. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Nate. I'm super excited to be here with you as we worship our King. And as we continue our series in Exodus, where we see that, uh, or this series titled, My Treasured Possessions. And so if you would, would you please join me as I pray for our time together. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today. Um, and Father, we just ask to see your glory. We, we ask to see your glory in our worship of you, um, in our fellowship with each other, and in your word. And Spirit, would you stir in our hearts this morning to see what it is that you'd want us to see. Protect us, guide us. We're thankful for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So some of you may or may not know, but I got the privilege of serving in the United States Marine Corps for over a decade. And I'm kind of biased, but there are no uniforms more distinguished than the Marines. Right? No more legendary than the dress blue uniform that we wear. Every inch of that uniform has meaning. It has purpose. The blood stripe. It's this crimson stripe that goes down the leg, and it represents the, the fallen Marines and the bloodshed of famous battles. The eagle, the globe and anchor is the symbol of the Marine Corps. With, with an eagle, eagle with his wings spread represents the burden that we have for the American people. And the globe represents our worldwide presence, right? A Marine can be anywhere when they're called. And then on the bottom, there's this anchor that protrudes from the EGA, and it represents our naval traditions. Right? We are soldiers of the sea. Every detail from the number of buttons to the belt loops all have significance. It has meaning. And these Marine Corps garments are adorned in blue and scarlet, gold and silver. And what they do is they remind us of the people we serve and the responsibility we carry. Well, church, Exodus 28 outlines the special garment or the uniform of Aaron and his sons, who are priests. And there's a specific focus on the high priest clothing. And while these garments are indeed beautiful, it's, it's what they symbolize that's truly glorious. And so why, as a community of believers, why do we care what the high priests wear? Why do we want the high priest to adorn these garments? Well, today it's my hope that we can see that these garments aren't merely a fashion statement, right? God isn't an almighty wardrobe designer or, or cosmic personal stylist, but we serve a God who is holy. 
And his holiness is reflected in the design and the purpose of these garments. Where these garments in this deepest sense represent the intercessory work of the high priest on behalf of God's people. And because we are unable to enter into God's presence ourselves, we need someone. We need a high priest to intercede for us. And these garments represent that work. And so this morning, we're going to examine intercession in three parts. First, we're going to see intercession for remembrance or, or prayer. Think of prayer when we see that word remembrance. Secondly, intercession for judgment or, or guidance or, or God's will for the people. And thirdly, we're going to see intercession for guilt. And so if you have a Bible, open to chapter 28, and we're going to begin with verse 1 and 4, which is going to set the stage for our three main points. Verse 1. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for the glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit, the, the spirit of skill. And they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. And they shall make garments for Aaron and your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. And so right here in Exodus, we have God establishing his priesthood. These men are charged with the responsibility to serve in and around God's dwelling place, the tabernacle. With the high priest as the leader of this priesthood, he acts as the mediator for the people. And so if you recall, a common theme or a reoccurring theme in Exodus is that, that God is holy, that we are sinful, and that we cannot approach him directly. But there must be a go-between, a mediator, right? someone to communicate between the two parties. And the high priest, he stands in that gap. And so unique is this position before God and before the people. So distinct is his duties. An entire chapter is dedicated to the wardrobe of the high priest. And verse 2 tells us their purpose. Right? They're, they're to be made for glory and for beauty. And so these garments represent, they, they create a visual representation of the, the holiness of God expressed through the duties of the high priest. And so I vividly remember my first interaction with a Marine. Right? He stood tall in his uniform with his shoulders back. He wore this midnight blue top lined with gold and blue. And, and on the, the shoulders was this ornamental piece with the eagle globe and the anchor. Right? There, there was this aura about him. And his uniform captured everyone's attention. In a deep sense, this, this is what we see with the high priest. This is what people would have seen and saw as they recognized that these garments separated him. They, they set him apart. They made him unique. That he represented something far greater than himself. And what makes these, tr these garments truly special, right, isn't the color. It isn't the shininess. It's what they mean. It's what they convey. Right? These are garments of intercession. And so let's examine the shoulder piece for our first point. Intercession of remembrance. Read with me verse 9 through 12. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, and in order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder piece of the ephod, as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. 
And so as our high priest enters into the work of the Lord, there's two stones on each shoulder with the 12 tribes of Israel as he carries them in before the Lord. Where these precious stones signify how important God's people are to him, how valuable they are. Right? These aren't just river rock pebbles, but these are precious engraved gold encased stones that are treasured and valuable. And so my kids sometimes will climb on my back and inevitably make their ways to my shoulders. And often the other kid sees and wants to join in with dad. And so I shift my daughter to my left shoulder and I'm leaning back as Max crawls up. And now I have both of my kids on my shoulders. I'm not sure how much longer I can do that with a six and seven year old, but it's beautiful. I, I get to carry these precious souls that God has entrusted to me. And this is the role of the high priest. Right? For the people, he carries their concerns before the Lord. And that, and that term remembrance is often associated with prayer. And so it might sound odd for us that God has to be reminded, but all it means is that the priest is bearing the burdens, the concerns of the people before a holy God. He's bringing to remembrance God's people. He bears them. And whatever, they, whatever they, it is that they're seeking for, they may be asking for provision, they may be seeking for justice, the high priest brings those needs before the Lord in prayer. And God is setting up his priestly system, right? Because of man's sin, they cannot have access to God. And likewise, for us today, we don't get to enter into God's presence because of sin, but because of that, God sent an even greater high priest. Church, we have a high priest who intercedes in Jesus. Our high priest, Jesus, is praying for us in heaven, presenting our needs and our trials and our difficulties before the Father. And these stones symbolically represent the people of God. And church, they should teach us of where they're actually placed, on the shoulders of the high priest. Recorded in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is dining with tax collectors and sinners, and then a bunch of religious people come in and they begin to grumble. And so Jesus tells us a story, a parable of the lost sheep. And so I'm just going to summarize it for us, but Jesus says that, that he, when he finds his lost sheep, he picks them up, he puts them on his shoulders, and he and all of heaven rejoices as he brings them into the fold of God. If you're a Christian in the room, remember that you were that lost sheep, hopeless until Jesus found you, he put you on his shoulders, and he rejoices. And church, this isn't just a one-time event. Yes, when, when God gets a hold of you, that happens once. But, but Jesus, the good shepherd, our high priest, is always interceding for us. It doesn't stop. But how easy do we forget in our struggles, we often overlook his strength. Right? We fail to rest in his power. We forget to lean on the shoulders of the great high priest. All of our guilt all of our stress and distress and failures and fears and anxieties, Jesus is saying, place them on my shoulders. Bring that hurt to me. Bring that guilt to me and that shame. And church, I, I know that some of you are struggling. Right? I've seen the tears and I've seen the pain. But Jesus wants us to offload those to the high priest so that he can bring them to remembrance before the Father. Financial challenges, sin struggles, relational strains, right? these are all real. Jesus wants us to give them over to him. I'm reminded of Psalm 68, verse 19, when it says, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation, church. Where God remembers his precious stones, his precious sons and daughters, as Jesus carries us before him. 
And so because of this, we can be confident and rest in our struggles and our anxieties on his shoulders because of the next part, because of the next piece of the garment, the breastplate of judgment. He carries our concerns. He holds us close to his heart. Point number two, there's intercession for judgment. Read with me verse 29 through 30. So Aaron shall bear the names of the son of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart. And when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breastpiece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart. And he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart, before the Lord regularly. We see in Deuteronomy that that the priests would help teach the law, that they would help make rulings, they would judge and make decisions on legal matters. The the high priest would provide a guidance to the people. And this form of intercession for the people, it often came by way of the priest's Enter into the presence of God, seeking his blessings, using this Urim and through me uh, to receive divine guidance. And the Bible isn't super clear on these two objects that were placed in the breastplate. However, we see in Ezariah and 1 Samuel that the, these objects were used to make some sorts of judgment or ruling for the people. It would help the high priest guide his people. And the high priest used this to discern the will of God in certain certain situations. And although the Bible isn't super clear, what we do know is that the high priest was critical, right? He was important to the people in providing guidance. And with the names of the tribes of Israel engraved on these precious stones over the heart of the high priest, he would go before the Lord and seek his presence, seek God's judgment, on the situation of the people. And so there was times in my military career where I had to stand in front of the commander with another Marine. And often there's only two reasons for that. Either he did something really, really good or he did something really, really bad. We actually had special uniforms for those moments of judgment. And in those scenarios, the commander, he was the judge and the jury. What, What he said went because of his authority. And those rulings could range from community service to the forfeiture of pay to even jail time. And every time I put on that uniform, in those situations, there was a weight. There was a heaviness. I couldn't imagine the weight of the guy that actually had to make the decision. Even more so, can you imagine the weight that the spiritual and emotional weight of the high priest as he puts on these garments, knowing that he's going to make judgment and he's going to give the will of God to the people. God commands him to, to carry the people, the burdens of the people near his heart. Right? He's not to be a judge who's apathetic or, or distant, but a judge who keeps his people close, who provides guidance in the most just way. And for me, church, this brings great comfort that as we approach God in our prayer, knowing that Jesus, our high priest, intercedes, that he's praying on our behalf, and that he will provide his will for our life. We no longer need Urim or the Thummim or an earthly high priest to discern God's will for us. We have Jesus. We have his Holy Spirit. We have his word. And together in prayer and counsel with other godly men and women, God will reveal his will for us. He will reveal his will for us. And so we are able to approach God through our high great priest, and we can have confidence in his guidance and that his ruling is trustworthy. The high priest not only plays a critical role in intercession and delivering God's judgment for the people. He also plays a responsibility in cleansing the the sacrifices offered by the people. 
And so next, we're going to look at the garments of intercession, the intercession for guilt. These are garments as intercessions for guilt. Read with me verse 36 through 38. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engravings of the signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it to the turban by a cord of blue. It shall be on the front of the turban. And that shall be on Aaron's forehead. And Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. And so at the center cap of the marine garment, there's that eagle globe and anchor that I spoke to you about. And in the mouth of the eagle, there's a banner. And inscribed on that banner is Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And it serves as a reminder of the commitment and sacrifice that we must make, as well as a charge of our responsibility. It, it reminds us of who we serve. And so whenever I put on that uniform, it brought to mind this, this duty and responsibility for the people. And as I've been reading Exodus 28 and going through the garments, I, I wondered myself, did the high priest have that similar sense of duty? As he put on these magnificent garments of intercession, I wonder what it brought to his mind and heart. Well, here we see added another piece to the glory and beautiful garments, the golden plate of the turban that reads, Holy to the Lord. This is a, a charge from God to the high priest, an inscription that indicates first and foremost that that priest belongs to God, that he is his servant. And the high priest is therefore reminded every time he puts on those garments that God is holy, and therefore the priest must be holy. Verse 38 says that Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. Right? You see, through Exodus and Leviticus, God, has, God gives instructions on how the people are to sacrifice. Right? Burnt offerings and grain offerings, and even a couple weeks, he took up an offering to make these garments. And when the people would bring them before the priest, if there was any fault, the priest would take away that guilt. And so if you belong to Israel, you knew you could have confidence that you could offer up something to God. It wouldn't be perfect, but that high priest would wipe away any of that guilt. And even the holy things, included the offerings, are affected by sin, allowing the entire nation to transfer their guilt onto the high priest. And then the high priest can then for transfer his holiness to the people. This favorable acceptance now occurs through Jesus, our high priest, right? Our perfect high, high priest, our, our perfect sacrificial atonement. Jesus not only saves his followers, but he sanctifies them. He, he makes them holy. And the high priest made the offerings holy to the Lord. Jesus does the same for his people. But this is why it's so important that we have a high priest. This is, this is why it's so important that we actually care about these garments. And as Scott mentioned last week about the altar, and we've been kind of hitting on throughout these, the altar, the tabernacle, the, these garments, right? They're just shadows of things to come. They're temporary. But Jesus is ultimately finds the fulfillment in them. Right, all of these elements, including include the high priest's office, is only temporary. Right, listen to Hebrews 7, verse 23 and 25. The, the former priests were many in number, but they were prevented by death from continuing the office. But he, Jesus, holds this priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost 
those who draw near to God through him. And listen, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Providence, we are not waiting for another high priest. Right? Jesus holds the priesthood permanently. Right? And if you're curious about where Jesus is at and, and what is he doing, church, he is interceding for his people right now, and you can call on him at any time and any day. Right? We don't need to worry about being perfect. We just need to present our imperfect selves and our imperfect deeds to the one who is holy. In him you are a precious treasure. For Israel's guilt to be brought before God, that they had to be in covenant with him. Right? That these names had to be recorded on these precious stones of the high priest. And as the, the high priest enters into the Lord's presence, God sees those names. He sees the names on the shoulder plates, and he sees the name on the breastplate, and, and he sees holy to the Lord on the forehead. And everything that the high priest did was then credited to the people of God. And this teaches us something profound, church, about God's people and the great high priest. Right, Providence, this is the gospel. And the truth is that we need a mediator. And since none of us can enter into God's presence without that, we need someone to intercede and in the Old Testament, Old Testament, your name could only be included if you belonged to, to Israel, right? If you were born into Israel or you came into the fold somehow. However, in the New Testament, there is no tribalness. It doesn't matter about where you're born. It's matter, it matters whether you've been born again through Jesus Christ. For the Christian, let this truth sink in that you are a precious stone in the sight of God, resting on the heart of Jesus, and that God sees you. And that his holiness, the holiness of the great high priest, is transferred over to the people's sin offering. Israel is a community of people reliant on the intercession of the high priest. And now we, church, our people not standing on our own merit, but on the shoulders and the heart and the holiness of our, our high priest, Jesus. He stands in heaven before our Holy Father, bringing to remembrance and continually, continuously interceding on our behalf. For those who would say, you're not a Christian, I just leave you with Jesus' words. Please hear this, John 3.3. 3. Truly, 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 I say to you, unless one is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. And my friends, new birth comes by way of placing our faith in Jesus. Believe me, you need, I need a high priest because we cannot get into his presence without Jesus. A great high priest has come to us, and apart from him, we cannot draw to the throne room of God. Before we can enter, we must go through the power of the high priest. We must break through that veil only through the high priest. And so let us clothe ourselves in the glory and the beauty of his son. Let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your son. I was reminded that, that as there's one time a year where the, the high priest would actually take off his garments, Lord, and he would go into the Holy of Holies and strip himself of those. And Lord, that reminds me of our sweet Jesus, who in his glory with you removed all of it. He was stripped of it. Right? These garments that were, were deserved for him was removed, and he was stripped. And, and at the end, he, he, he didn't even have 
any clothes on, Lord. And he did that for his children. He did that for those who would have faith in him, that he is our great interceder, Lord. He is our great high priest, and we are so thankful that you've sent him, that those who place their faith in him would have everlasting life, not because of their works, but because of his work. And Lord, would you impress that on us today and throughout the week? Lord, would we be reminded of your goodness? Would we be reminded to tell others of your son that they could offload their burdens and he would bear them up on his shoulders and that he would have them close to his heart if they but repent from their sins and turn to you. And so Jesus, we, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your mercy and your grace each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.